Good morning. When I uh, think about speaking at uh, refugee conferences, I always like to acknowledge to myself that we're on Indigenous land, and I also like to acknowledge that I'm the grandson of four Jewish refugees, two Jewish European refugees. It just helps me to put everything I'm saying and thinking about in context. So um, I thank the previous speakers because that uh, very help, was very helpful in situating the context that uh, we're working in today. And there are many challenges and opportunities for Canada right now. Uh, the um, first thing I want to talk about is how much words matter. You hear very often in the media, all too often in the media and in the Conservative Party, speakers, uh, members of parliament, uh, immigration critic, we hear the word illegal with regards to the asylum seekers who walk across the border from the United States, as was outlined before. Uh, I'm very happy that the speakers uh, today have uh, the government. And the government, it must be said, generally avoids using the word illegal to describe the people who cross by land. And the other word that's used very often in the media is a flood. Uh, the speaker today has talk, talked about a significant increase. But think of the image that comes to your mind when you read in the Globe Mail or some other publication that there is a flood of illegals coming to Canada. First of all, as I'm going to say in a minute, it's factually wrong to say that anyone who's an asylum seeker could have arrived illegally. It's According to, law, uh, there's a, huge, a very large group of law professors who a few months ago signed a declaration about that. My group, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, uh, issued a uh, legal opinion, but it's very clear to any expert, according to Can Immigration and Refugee Protection Act and international law, you cannot be illegal in a country if you've made a refugee claim. If you haven't made a refugee claim and you crossed uh, Rock Roxham Road, like thousands of people are doing right now, um, that would be illegal. If I were to cross as a Canadian citizen, and uh, I would be a violation of the Customs Act. There's no doubt about it. But asylum seekers have a right under Canadian and international law to make a refugee claim. Some come by boat, many come by airplane, and in the last two years, as we've seen, a very significant increase in the numbers that come across by land. Uh, the And another word that is very troubling is the use of the word crisis. The media and the, in my opinion, the Conservative Party tries to portray it as a crisis. I think there, in my opinion, there's a political agenda behind that. And it's, if you speak to anybody who has worked overseas with refugees, Syrian refugees under the hundreds of thousands and millions who are living in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, who have crossed into Greece and Italy. Sweden has taken huge numbers of asylum seekers. Germany has taken more than a million. The 50,000 people who make refugee claims um, in the past uh, two years, each year, in 2017 and probably this year, it's coming out to that. That's a drop in the bucket. And as the previous speaker said, we are isolated ge geographically and we have the resources. It's not a crisis of uh, an economic crisis. It's merely a, a it's, not, it's not, as the speakers have outlined, a logistical crisis. The Canadian government has been very effective at dealing with, handling, and managing the uh, for many many years. There's always been an increase uh, webs and ebbs and flows. If you go further back, in I think it's around 2002, we had almost 50,000 asylum seekers at that time. And then it gradually went down and has gone back up. And we always manage very effectively, not perfect, but we're very effective at uh, adapting to these relatively uh, low numbers by world standards. So, um, so it's rather than a crisis, I think if we use the word challenge, when the average person reads about <clears throat> a crisis with regards to illegal migrants um, flooding across the border. You know, the word flood 
I think for most of us, flood is something that is terrifying. It kills people, it destroys houses. So I think that it's a really, really important to be careful of the words that we use. As we say in French, les paroles blessent. Words can hurt people. And um, the, I want to talk a bit about the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, and that, it was mentioned a little bit by the um, previous speakers. Why is it now that since 2017, there are a significant increase in people walking across the border? So the U.S. Safe Third Country Agreement has been in place, as mentioned, since 2004. But what happened in 2017? Well, of course, Pre President Trump took office. And that's not the only factor, but that's a very significant factor. When I, in my practice, ask clients, why did you not claim asylum in the United States? Because the Immigration and Refugee Board members typically ask that question. I know why, but I ask them that first. And the first, thing you, first word out of their mouths is Trump. When you hear a man who is the President of the United States vilifying Muslims, vilifying Latin Americans, vilifying refugees in general, and instituting draconian measures to detain people, separate children from their parents. We've read all about this. I mean, it's, it's sad and it's terrifying that in the United States of America, this could be going on. Um, and the, if that wasn't bad enough, in the past year, um, I think about six months ago, the Trump administration instituted policy such that people who are victims of domestic violence are not even eligible, not even eligible to make a refugee claim. And also people who are victims of gang violence are not eligible. So the question in the context of the Safe Third Country Agreement, Safe Third is supposed to be about having, um, assuming that the United States is a safe country for refugees, so they should apply whatever country they first arrive in with the assumption that we have roughly, not identical, but roughly similar standards. And I think it's getting increasingly, in my opinion, it's getting increasingly difficult to maintain that position. So um, there's a root, that, that's why there's a reason where, why so many refugee claimants who in the past would have chosen to apply in the United States are now seeking asylum in Canada. I do think, and I should mention too, there's litigation. I'm not going to talk in any details about it, but there's uh, the Canadian Council for Refugees, Amnesty International, the Canadian Council for Churches have uh, taken, are challenging the constitutionality of the Safe Third Country Agreement in the Federal Court of Canada. That's uh, ongoing litigation and something to uh, look out for. One basic thing, when you talk to people who work in the field of refugees, whether on the government side or amongst advocates or with lawyers, um, NGOs. <coughs> Over the years, there's one theme that comes out. We need a system that's fast, fair, and final. And I think there's a fairly large consensus on what that means. And what comes up over and over again is you need resources. You can tinker with the system all you want. There's been changes made over the years. But if there are not enough resources in the system, the system gets overwhelmed. So I am happy that the uh, Canadian government in uh, the spring in the budget did provide more resources, particularly to the Immigration and Refugee Board. But according to the Immigration and Refugee Board, it's not enough. It just allowed the waiting times for a hearing have gone up to about more than a year and a half. And what happens when the waiting times are so long is you have uh, migrants who know they're probably going to be refused and because they, they don't, they probably don't meet the definition of refugee. Like many Haitians have a strong, very strong humanitarian case there. Uh, their houses were destroyed in, and they lost family during the earthquake, but it doesn't meet, usually doesn't meet the refugee definition. But if you have waiting times that are, are a year and a half, then people have an incentive to come in and take a chance and work and uh, and perhaps they'll find some other way to stay in Canada. So you're further increasing. It's been more of a, a pool factor of bringing people to Canada who are not necessarily 
qualifying as asylum seekers, and that further erodes public opinion, public perception that this system is, uh, is a positive system that deserves public support. That's, that comes under question, aided and abetted by a certain, a certain political party. And so in um, vesting more funds to increase the number of decision makers, and I think also, to be fair, uh, providing more resources to the IRCC and uh, Canadian Border Services Agency, you're protecting the integrity of the system. You're investing money, but you're saving money down the road. And that's such a basic, simple thing, but for some reason, over the years, uh, governments, uh, I think that the people who work in the immigration minister's office really understand that. Um, I think the challenge has been to convince people in the finance department to <laughs> put the funds down and an adequate, and again, they did do something in March, and I commend the government for that, but it's clearly not enough. And finally, I just want to conclude by saying, in terms of our language, in terms of our actions, Canada has been, the previous speaker mentioned Pier, Pier 21, and I went back there for the second time uh, in June myself, and that's where most of my grandparents arrived when they came to Canada. And you know what jumps out at me is that there's two Canadas, historically and even in recent years. On the one hand, there was the Canada of the head tax against Chinese immigrants, uh, the none is too many policy against Jews, where during World War II, during the Holocaust, a leading immigration official, a leading member of the, the cabinet, told the prime minister, who was at, he was asked how many people, how many Jews should be let in, and he said, none is too many. And that was the name of a book written by a very prominent historian. So that the Canada of uh, the head tax, none is too many. The Canada that put Japanese Canadians in uh, concentration camps during World War II. And, and the Canada that, in the previous government, slashed health care for refugee claimants as a way to drive them, uh, try to deter people from coming to Canada, which the federal court found to be cruel and unusual treatment and uh, unconstitutional. There's that Canada. But there's also the Canada that welcomed in thousands of Hungarian refugees after the uh, Hungarian Revolution in the 1950s. There is also the Canada that welcomed in tens of thousands of boat people in the 1970s. And there's the Canada that welcomed thousands of, of um, Syrian refugees in which private groups all across Canada came together and raised money and were uh, bringing in Syrians. That Canada is the Canada that I love and I think the Canada that we can all work together to build. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention one more thing is that just something to think about as we go. We don't have time to discuss it, but the impact of climate change on forced migration, it's already dramatic. And these are not necessarily people who meet the refugee def definition, but there's already 10, of tens of millions of people directly or indirectly. Some say the Syrian civil war was partially related to a very long ongoing drought. Something to think about going forward. Thank you.